hold it around the world. <laughs> and then other direction. All right. Dope. Thank you. So I'm a historian of education. And so what we're going to be doing today is I'm going to give you um, some some history lessons, some brief history lessons. We're going to go over about, um, gosh, about 15 years of history. Well, actually, we're going to start really far back. So we're going to go back about uh, 200 years in history. And then we'll uh, take a brief snapshot of the Black Freedom Movement um, as student protests are happening. And then we'll um, we'll transport to the present. So uh, we're a little bit all over the place. But we're going to be heavily focused on like a, a five to 10 year period for this moment. So the title of this workshop I um, gave, or the title that I gave is How We Get Here, right? Um, and I could have said, how did we get here? Um, but I was intentional about using like how we get here, because um, this is the way I would probably say it to my friends. Um, and then the subtitle is Education for Liberation, Pedagogies of Protest. And I'll talk more about how we got to those subtitles in a second. All right, so next, Bam. all right, turn and talk. Um, so you're gonna um, turn to the person next to you or the people next to you. You don't have to write for this one, but you will write for the next one. So you, you're gonna think on the spot for this one. But what made you come to this session? What are you hoping to walk away with? And so um, I'm gonna give you, let's say two minutes two minutes to kind of talk about that, right? Like, what, what made you come to this session? You can be as honest as you need to. I'm trying to get my credits. Like, <laughs> um, but the second question is going to take a little bit more work, right? So what are you hoping to walk away with? And so I want you to take some time to think about that. All right. And I'll set the timer. Go. About one more minute. All right, we're down to like last 10, 15 seconds. If you want to wrap up your last thought or part of the conversation. All right, dope. All right, so um, the question was, what made you what made you come to this session? What are you hoping to walk away with? So um, who wants to share what their partner shared? Um, or if you want to share what you shared, you know, like, I'm bold, I got this. Um, who, who wants to share? I'm not going to do that old school call out method. Yes, go ahead. Yes, I know the name. Yeah. <laughs> mm. Mm. 
Thank you. Thank you. No, whenever people share, I feel like I'm all about giving people their flowers. So <laughs> especially in this big room. Yes, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Nice. All right. Thanks, y'all. You can do the clap too. Snapping's easier for me, especially because I got one hand available to me right now. So, um, yeah. So, Ed Majors, Ed and Social Justice, doing the work collectively. I heard accountability coming forward. Um, come through accountability. Nothing wrong with you know checking in um, and and holding each other accountable. Um, can I get one more person to share? If there are more, I'm cool too. But at least one. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes, history of ed. Yeah. So I, I I also draw from the concept of Sankofa, like right, the Sankofa bird looking back in order to 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 look forward, right? So how do we how do we see ourselves um, kind of taking the step backward to and, and to also think of time as like a thing that's always always in continuation. The history is always being made. Um, that it's not a, it's not divorced from our present and it's always connected to our future. So um, we're going to be doing a lot of um, time travel today. Um, that makes me sound way cooler than it really is, but let's like pretend like we're having, all right. Um, so here's your um, writing assignment, first writing task for the day. You'll have two writing tasks. I'll be checking these um, at the end of the, the time session. So um, I have a rubric, I'm kidding. Um, so how did you end up here? Tell me your story. So we talked about how you ended up in this session, right? But how did you end up here in higher education um, as a student or as an educator? So if you're a student, what drove slash inspired you to pursue this level of education? And if you're an educator, what drove slash inspired you to pursue this path? Um, so you don't have to tell like every single detail, um, right? But um, some, some of you might have like a, a quick anecdote in mind. So notice my little asterisks at the bottom. If you have a specific memory or anecdote, you can start there. If not, feel free to list some of the key steps you took to get here. Yes. I was totally kidding. Those were all jokes. I'm not, no, I have my own stuff to grade. Um, no, <laughs> thank you for checking in though, yeah. Um, so yeah, uh, just take a moment, and this is for you. Everything you write today, I kind of want you to be able to walk away with, because um, I want you, to, I want these to cook. We only have a, a little bit of uh, time here today, so I set my timer. Let's say three minutes, and if you need more, just hold up a finger or two for how many more minutes you might need.
All right, a little bit more than a minute left. Actually, a little bit less than a minute, my bad. <laughs> Looks like most of you are almost done. Find a spot to stop. Um, that's my loud timer, apologies. All right, so this one we won't do the turn and talk for because you will have a turn and talk later, but I do wanna still have three people share out um, from the group. So what what brought you to this point? How did you end up at Duchess? How did you end up in, um, in higher ed, uh, post-baccalaureate life, either as an educator or as, um, as a student? Three new hands would be awesome and amazing. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Can I get at least two more hands? Bam. All right. I see you in the back. Go ahead. Yes. Yes. Thank you. So we're, I'm seeing some threads, right? Like folks going going back to school because of connections to education and there's this desire to make a change, a desire to go back to your roots, stomping grounds, yeah. <laughs> um, and this connection, right, to, to education as um, something that like, um, it's almost like connected to like this, this part of a, per, uh, like a personality almost or a connection to who you are. It's a part of your identity. I think that's huge. One more. Go ahead. I read your obituary and you had a speaker mm -hmm. in um, Austin. And um, when you were speaking, my honorary track was had no connection to the Lord, <laughs> but uh, with all I just read about it. But the Duchess can help you to still take whatever steps that they need to and that you have the opportunity to bring people to the table. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Um, y'all are hooking me up. It's almost like y'all were planted in this room, so thank you, um, making my job much easier. So um, I'm going to take us to the next section, um, which is basically like kind of the overview of how we were, where we're going or how we got here. So I have some guiding questions. So I use this framework of stealing the meeting, and I'll talk about what that means as, uh, in a second to kind of like trace how black education moves in the United States and its implications for education broadly. And then how has it shown up in college level organizing? We'll be talking about some college level organizing today. 
And then how are the political exigencies of our present linked to our individual and collective pasts and futures? It's a long ass question. Um, uh, the fast way is just like, what, what's happening now? <laughs> and are they linked to the past and the future? How is our present linked to the past and future? But I use exigencies because it gives that like, sense of urgency. Like, what, is the, what are the demands of the moment? Um, and then what does this have to do with you? Like, why, why, why should you care? Why should we care? Um, so context to know. Um, we already done some of this, the you, me, us, right? Our, our histories and, and how we come to this conversation. And then I'll talk about the conceptual framework. I'll take us through the Black Freedom Movement. We'll talk about today as in the present, not this very day. But I mean, hey, it might be for you. And then tomorrow as in our future. All right, so in the book, The Education of Blacks in the South, uh, James Anderson talks about basically um, education from enslavement through about 1935. Yep, bam. So <laughs> through 1935. And um, there's an oral history that, that I found there, and I actually found uh, the transcript of that oral history. A woman by the name of Elizabeth Sparks talks about stealing the meeting. And so that practice is a practice wherein um, free black folks would sneak onto the plantation to teach enslaved black folks how to read and write. And this is more so like a non-hierarchical um, exercise where, it's like where children were actually teaching some adults how to read and write. And so, you know, like growing up, we kind of hear phrases like children are to be seen and not heard. And, you know, you're a child to stay in a child's place. Well, the child's place in this context was actually like co-constructed learning space. Um, so thinking about how educational spaces um, were already disrupted and, and, and actually generative in black life long before we get an established um, educational system in the United States. Um, when uh, before enslavement is over, um, free black folks are already and enslaved black folks are already starting to think about ways that they are going to create um, educational systems. And so the gift, one of the many gifts that black America gives to the, um, to the United States um, uh, by and large is education, that public education is a gift from our enslavement to our liberation. So. Um, just wanted to give you that concept, uh, or that, that history really quickly. There's a scholar by the name of Jarvis Givens who talks about a similar concept. He calls it fugitive pedagogy because it was literally illegal to read and write. So the, we have people sneaking onto plantations when it's illegal, they, and it's punishable by like abuse or imprisonment or even death in some cases. And that's how important um, uh, education was. And so when we think about that legacy, I want us to kind of take that with us as we're talking about other resistance um, spaces in um, education history. Cool? All right, bam. So um, jumping ahead 100 years. <laughs> um, uh, so I'm now in the Black Freedom Movement. Um, there are ways that education for liberation shows up here um, that requires us to think about what liberty looks like. If we're talking about the, if we're talking about being particip participants in the U.S. structure, part of that has to deal with the vote. And so, um, as many of you know from history, um, that uh, particularly more so in the South, but it's still widespread, that there are a bunch of like racist literacy laws. And so we saw this kind of coming back into conversation in, in 2020 <laughs> when we think about all the different ways that like there was, you know, questions about voter registration fraud, all these um, different voter registration stipulations. And it's like, whoo, history is repeating itself. Um, and so folks who were engaged in this battle for, um, for um, literacy and what they would call literacy tests for, um, for, for voter registration, um, we're actually creating these schools called citizenship schools. And so the school is basically to equip folks to pass the test. Now, not everyone had to take this test, right? So um, the tests were usually given to black people. And so um, in these citizenship schools, they would teach all kinds of things like like actual basic literacy, but also like literacy about the Constitution and different um, different areas within the United States structure. And so um, this is, this is the structure of the citizenship schools, but I wanted to highlight a woman by the name of Septima Clark. So she was a teacher who was actually, um, you know, teaching for a long period of time, but she was also affiliated with the NAACP. And her local school district was like, you have to dis like disband, all ties, denounce your affiliation with the, the NAACP. She goes, yeah, right. And so Septima Clark and a number of other folks actually don't leave the NAACP, they get kicked out of their local school districts. 
So um, there's a school by the name of Highlander, a huge political kind of beacon within the South, which becomes an organizing space for a lot of folks. People who we know who are major leaders come through Highlander School. Rosa Parks comes through the Highlander School. Ella Baker comes through Highlander School. And these are folks who are actually thinking and, and planning and strategizing for um, ways to engage in activist um, activity, right? And so September Clark is actually building this structure out. What's cool about September Clark and her cousin, Bernice Robinson, who actually had no educational, no formal educational training, is that they used the lives of the people in order to teach them how to engage in literacy practice. Um, so um, we always talk about you know, student-centered pedagogy. A lot of this is coming in the civil rights movement, but it's also um, pre-Paulo uh, Freire. So how many of you have heard of or read Pedagogy of the Oppressed? Right, so famous, famous text. So he um, publishes this book in about 1970. Um, they're working in citizenship schools around 1957. So y'all do the math, right? <laughs> but a lot of the models that he's picking up in his later texts are actually um, taken from literally the examples that they provide. So Bernice Robinson was like, who doesn't know how to read in the room? And then um, you know some of the high schoolers would like laugh at some of the adults who didn't know how to read. And so she was like, there are certain things that you can't do that these folks can do. And so she creates a space where they, they feel comfortable learning and being able to say, hey, these are things that I don't have access to. So in this space, Bernice Robinson says, um, but we're going to learn together, right? Uh, you're going to teach me some things, and maybe there are a few things I might be able to teach you, but I don't consider myself a teacher. I just feel that I'm here to learn with you, you know, learn things together, the co-constructed space. And I think sometimes when we think about education, we're so focused on our own individual measures that we, we forget how uh, education is always a communal effort. Learning is always a communal effort. Um, even if we're reading a book on our own, it's an engagement with somebody else. We're always in conversation with somebody. So I, I want us to also take that into consideration. Um, next, so when we um, transition from, you know, people have this, this, um, this timeline in their minds that civil rights is one mark and then black power is another mark. I use the phrase black freedom movement because these are concurrent practices, or concurrent ide ideologies and actions happening. So when we, we talk about, you know, th there's always the dichotomy we get between Malcolm X and, um, and Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. as if they're the only two people who engaged in this fight at the time. But I think it's important to, to mark these two um, chronologically because they are existing within the exact same time frame. So when we talk about civil rights to black power, a lot of the black power um, folks draw their inspiration from the, the teachings of, of Malcolm. And, and to think about black power as, as not being this thing that the stage that just kind of happens directly after civil rights movement, but that they're, they're happening alongside each other. Um, similar trajectories, same end goal, different methods in, in engaging in that end goal. Um, and so I want to highlight um, two of four activists. So how many of you have ever heard about Jimmy Garrett? If you haven't, don't, don't feel embarrassed. OK, that's what I figured was going to happen. This is good. All right. How many of you have ever heard of Chester Higgins? Also figured that was going to happen. How many of you have heard of Angela Davis? Also knew that was going to happen. See, I know. I'll be knowing. All right. So, um, so um, and then Gwen Patton. All right, so I'm going to highlight two of these folks really quickly. I'll just give you, um, if you, uh, I would say take a photo of this slide, go look them up for your own personal homework. Um, I think what happens is when we, when we talk about um, history, not just black history, but when we talk about history, two things happen. We, we spend a lot of time on cis, hetero, patriarchal men or male figures, <laughs> right? And then, um, and then we spend a lot of time on like the charismatic figure. And I think what, what's missing in between are a bunch of folks who are just like everyday, regular ass people. And so we're gonna talk about two of those people um, right now. So in this next slide, um, Jimmy Garrett. So when you think about black student unions that happen all across the nation, um, the, the one person who's behind this is this, this is Jimmy Garrett at around, you know, uh, he's about 20, 21 years old at the time. So this dude starts um, engaging in activist activity at age 14. He was born and raised in the South, well, partially raised in the South, moves to California when he's about 12 or 13. Um, and then his parents are like, you are acting up in school. We're sending you back to live with the other family members over the summers. So he goes back to live with other family members over the summer. What happens? He gets involved in activist activity. He's in sit-ins. He's in marches. 
uh, one summer, I think he gets arrested seven times. So his parents are like, we're going to send you to the South. And then what happens? He gets in more trouble, but it's generative trouble. So he actually goes away to college, not so that he can, you know, essentially just get a degree, but he's looking at colleges as spaces of organizing activity. And um, in, the, in about 1964, he arrives, I think I got the time right, it might be 62. Fact check me after this, but <laughs> it's either 62 or 64 is definitely an even number. Um, he starts off at San Francisco State University, at that time at San Francisco State College, and he's like already been involved in the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, all be, already been involved in all of, this, um, all of these different major actors in the civil rights movement. So he says, we need to have an organizing space for black students. And, and that's how the, the first major black student union is born at San Francisco State College. Um, and so what's so cool about his engagement is that even as a junior in college, he's teaching graduate classes. He's teaching graduate classes um, in African American history. Um, and so thinking about how a, a student who's like, hey, these are the things we need to mobilize for, these are the things that we need, and here's how we're gonna create this at the college. And so the very first uh, black studies program is actually spearheaded by a group of students. There's another student in, next to him in this photo, but I just wanted to highlight Jimmy Garrett. Um, and then what happens after he graduates? Well, he continues in, um, in activism, but he also becomes like a major like kind of cool nerd. Two PhDs, um, my first one is still hurting my feelings. Um, and so, um, but two PhDs and, and goes on and does a lot of major work after this. Gwen Patton is also an activist. She's also involved in the Student Nonviolent Co uh, Coordinating Committee. Um, at, in Tuskegee, there's a huge uprising. And you would think like, why is there an uprising about black studies at a black institution? Tuskegee Institute is a, is a, uh, is a historically black college. Um, Gwen Patton is the president of the Associated Student Body at this time, and um, she's engaged with the community. They're trying to figure out what the community needs are. They're recognizing that there's some class differences happening on campus and outside of campus. There's a lot of things that students want that the faculty want that are not going forward. And so there's one faculty member kind of engaging with the students to kind of help them not just have um, more opportunities on the Tuskegee campus, but to also think about ways to protect black students who are on and off campus and to provide access um, amidst this, you know, um, like major revitalization of activity in the South. So um, she actually leaves the post and says, you know what, I'm gonna step down. I got some other activist projects I wanna take on, somebody else become president. And she leaves during that time. But um, she also becomes a scholar, um, engaged in all different forms of activism after that, as a part of Jesse Jackson's Rainbow Coalition, the first cohort. So she's, you know, doing big things. Doesn't get two PhDs, but still gets a PhD, right? So we're thinking about these students who are creating opportunities for others, but also thinking about how they, they create legacies, and then they go on to continue to uh, organize. So things that we learn from folks like Jimmy Garrett, Gwen Patton, and Angela Davis, I could tell you more after if you wanna learn about Angela, is that they are basically the folks who are kind of pushing for a lot of this activity that happens in this really short time period. So basically from 1965 to 1970, the world of education becomes a lot blacker and a lot browner. <laughs> and it's because of the activist activities that are happening with just everyday regular uh, students. Um, but the thing that folks miss is that these students weren't acting alone. They were connected to local activist organizations, the Black Panther Party, SNCC, CORE, they're also connected to um, folks on campus. I talked about Gwen Patton being connected to faculty members. They're talking to administrators. They're talking to librarians. They're creating their own educational structures so that they can have a political orientation, so that they can all have shared language, shared goals, shared motives about how they're gonna change the campus. And, and I don't know if they actually thought that their change on the campus was gonna have not just a national impact, but a global impact. And so we think about all of this happening over time. Um, if I have more time, I go way more in depth, but I want y'all to get some thinking and talking time into. <laughs> um, so what are some things that we see in common? I, I, I kind of gave you a preview of these. They saw a need and they strategized. Um, they read and became rooted in philosophy and politics. They read to understand and change their reality. So 
talk, coming back to that concept of still in the meeting, right? Some of these meetings were covert. They were happening <laughs> behind closed doors. Some of them were out in public. They were handing out leaflets and newspapers to folks. They were trying to get them in and to get them on board. Um, they garnered support from all levels. So from student to student, from student to teacher, from teacher to uh, administrator. Um, they also were engaged in community uh, politics and local chapters of national organizations. They organized and played the long game. They stuck it out. They knew like, yes, oh, we're frustrated. We want change now. And they, they did get some things moving for the now, but they, they, they made sure to organize structures um, that would live on after them. Um, and I think that's so important. And finally, their commitments changed, but they maintained a, a black liberatory consciousness. So that, that dude with the camera, Chester Higgins, um, is sometimes we think that everybody has to be ready with the fist in hand, or they gotta be ready you know, with cool shades and a nice, that's a really nice like done fro. I, I need to talk to that barber. But, um, but some folks are just like, I'm a photography major. <laughs> or, or actually I think his major was like business management, but he was taking photography classes and was like, this is fun. And he filmed, um, or yeah, got on film, a lot of the activist activities happening at this time. Goes on to become a renowned photographer, and like his, he's in exhibits at the MoMA. He's um, like been like a Newsweek, um, uh, uh, actually a regular photographer for New York Times for over 40 years. Um, and so thinking about sometimes, you, you know, someone said this earlier about like, we always think that there's like a certain way that we're supposed to engage in politics or a certain way that we're supposed to engage in the fight. And sometimes your fight is just doing the thing that you do very well. Um, and now, um, we're back, <laughs> look, I forgot I went all the way back. <laughs> we're back to you. You got another thinking task and you're gonna do another speaking task. Let me check on time. Okay, ooh, I love it here. Y'all got 15 minutes? Okay. <laughs> so thinking about the earlier uh, focused right about motivation, what's different about who and where I am now, right? So think about what drove you to this space, how you ended up here. Remember that question? Go back to your, your writing assignment. It's a good chance to review. And then what is different about what drove me here and, then, and where I am now? And they might be exactly the same. But sometimes you have to go back and figure out like, how did I end up here again? <laughs> you, you, right, this is our chance to look back at our individual past to figure out how we got to this point and how are those things similar or different. And then thinking about your roles now. So what are my individual student slash educator slash admin needs? What are my needs, right, individually? And how does where I am now connect to where I want to be? Who am I in community with? thinking about those major movements again, right? None of those existed in isolation. Who am I in community with? And then notice my italics, because I was you know, trying to be intentional. Um, who do I want to be in community with, right? Who am I talking to? And then what skills and resources do I bring? I'm all about assets, right? A lot of time we talk about deficits. No, 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 what am I bringing to the table? You ever been in one of those moments where you like, trying to figure out how you're gonna get a ride home. I don't know if this, is, this, this still applies, but <laughs> you're trying to figure out how I'm gonna get a ride home or we're all hungry and we need something and everyone takes out all of their money and they're like, okay, I got three quarters and a half a stick of gum, right? And we're trying to figure out how everyone's gonna get fed from whatever's there. I think it's important to think about that. Like, what are our resources? What do we have? What is right before us now? And how are we gonna combine those resources for what we need to move forward? So let's take a moment. That's a lot of questions. You might not get to all of them, so pick the two that are, that two, if you can't answer all of them, pick the two that you know that you can answer within three minutes. <laughs> um, and then if you can answer more, then answer more. So whatever you can do in three minutes, go for it. But they don't have to be in that order. All right, so I'm setting my timer. I'll give you three and a half minutes because I'm feeling generous. All right, go for it.
or if you can, try to find a stopping point. Find your neighbors. All right, I'm gonna give y'all a little bit of time to chit chat. So go ahead and turn to the people next to you um, and give a moment to, to share. So I'll, I'll set the timer again for three minutes because I feel like this is gonna be some generative conversation and then um, I'll check in with you. All right, hold up a finger or two to let me know how much time you need. Okay, I'm seeing I'm, I see a two and a one. All right, I'm gonna set, the, set it for a minute and a half. How about that, right in between. <laughs>
Mic check, one, two, one, two. Um, I got a lot of 80s hip hop in my heart. I won't beatbox for y'all though. Um, all right, so, um, so I am going to, uh, so um, small interesting tidbit about me is I, um, I used to play the piano in a band with my siblings. And so when I had to type right here, I was like, oh my gosh, I'm being transported about 15 years. Um, <laughs> just up here with y'all, um, you know, this, this is uh, this first song tonight. I'm just kidding. But I'm going to be taking notes right here from the front on some of the things that y'all are sharing. I was being nosy as hell in the conversations. I love where y'all were coming from. I was like, ooh, I could stay here all day, but I know we all have things to do, so sorry. Um, so I'm ready to hear what y'all got. I'm going to be taking notes um, and then um, just speak because it makes it easier for me to not have to point and ask things. So once the other person finishes their point, you just pick up on the next one. Cool? All right. So whoever's going to go first, start talking. I'll start typing. Go ahead. Thank you. Snap, snap, y'all. <laughs> All right, next. Snap, y'all, snap. <laughs> All right, next. I heard y'all conversations. Don't be trying to front. Jump in. Go for it. Thank you so much. Snap it up, snap it up. And uh, also, thank you for going twice, because I think that also comes back to our conversation about who we're in conversation with. So um, thank you for adding that. Um, next, at least one more, but I'm cool with two. <laughs> Mm -hmm. So now I have no idea what y'all are talking about. Uh, but I think the biggest thing is like age wise, I think I think that's the other thing that probably the biggest thing is age wise for me. Mm -hmm. Snap it up, y'all. Snap it up. Did we snap it up for you, too? Or did I okay, I was about to say, did I start talking? <laughs> start talking before your snaps came? <laughs> all right. Um, 
thank you so much for sharing. And I like to keep these notes in mind too, uh, also to think about how we, um, one, how this conversation is going to be connecting to other conversations. I work in the SEEK program. I didn't even give you all the spiel about what SEEK does. So SEEK is, you were talking about TRIO and ELP related programs. SEEK is among those, right? And um, and you were talking about uh, coming back to uh, DCC because you were a DCC student. So I was an ELP student and I teach in the SEEK program, which is similar to the programs that I came from. But um, SEEK uh, creates educational opportunities for folks who did who were under-resourced in high school. Um, and so um, a lot of the things that we think about in, in school is, is, is about the class that we teach is called education and justice. And so the, the questions I'm asking you about where you've been, where you are, where you're going, who can you be in communi communication with, that slide about the, the how the black studies, ethnic studies, all of those things are resources that I pull back into the classroom um, to see ourselves as actors in, um, in our own educational spaces and beyond those educational spaces. So that with that in mind, uh, as an educator, I always like to have a closure activity. Sometimes that bell rings, you don't have it. So, <laughs> but I do have a quick moment. So your closure activity today, this is your, your exit ticket. <laughs> yeah. So how I'm feeling is one under attack by much and still inspired. Um you know, maybe there's more to that outline. And that's my next point which would be get started on my work. Thank you. Snap, snap it up, snap it up. <laughs> All right. Other folks? Yes. So the frustration is being combated with all these realities that are up against students, up against teachers, and then be like, hey, <laughs> so about uh, lesson number 217, right? And then, but the other thing that's that you um, bring forward is like learning more about how you're going to combat that. Yeah. Thank you. Snap it up, snap it up. Um, can I get at least one more? Go ahead. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> nice. All right, snap it up. Oh, look, y'all didn't even need me that song. Come through. Um, I want to thank you so much for um, um, giving me that extra amount of time. And I also want to thank you for the ways that you're thinking through this seriously. And um, I want you to take these questions with you, right? Like, what are your next moves? Even as I was like sharing this and I was typing this out, I was like, ooh, what is, wh what's my next move, right? Um, and there are other departments I need to be in conversation with at my, at my institution. So I'm going to do my homework. I encourage you to do yours. 
Um, last thing, if you want to contact me, I'm on social media. I'm also on my email um, too often, sadly. Um, uh, hit me say, up. Huh? Yeah. Say a word about the mixer. Oh, is yes. This, this one is, yes, this one is, uh, this one is a sit in right here. And these are students actually vying for like a, a list of demands. I can't remember which institution this one was. Um, I forgot that fact. But I can tell you actually every other photo except for this last photo <laughs> of what, what school it's in. But I can um, pull it up and then find it for you. Um, but yeah, this is actually a demonstration among students. And I think the year was 1964. Um, but I have to remember the exact location. But this is a, a sit-in location. And the other ones I had were two from San Francisco State, two from Tuskegee, and then one Angela Davis. Oh, I'm sorry. But <laughs> yeah, thank you for that question. Um, and my contact information. I don't think I have a photo on this slide. Follow me at Instagram or Twitter um, at Robert T. Robinson or the same. And then if you want to email me, if you're like, I want to know digital archives, I want to know other resources and materials to connect with, um, also let me know. Um, and that's my government email, robinson at jv.cu.edu. If you remember this, you remember everything. That's Instagram, Twitter, and even my Gmail. So if you if you got this one, you got all of them. Um, <laughs> Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for, for wrapping with me.